Kavi. Today we have a very special friend, a very dear friend, Vandit Kalia, who is a very experienced wildlife, nature, and underwater photographer. In fact, he's probably one of the most experienced underwater scuba persons in India today. And whatever I know today, whatever I've learned from scuba diving, I've all learned from him. He helped me by the hand and took me down and showed me the wonderful world of underwater and taught me how to scuba dive. He taught me so well that today maybe I can take him up with hand and show him a few things. What do you say, Vinny? Over to Absolutely. you, Vinny. <laughs> Especially bull sharks, huh? <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's funny, guys. I, I used to, um, I've always had like an interest in wildlife and nature. And uh, I, I've also had zero patience, right? Since a kid, my mother is like, when I was a kid, I used to get smacked by my mom a lot saying, you know, you, you need to learn patience, you need to learn patience. I'm one foot taller than her now, but she still smacks me sometimes. And be like, oh, Kote, where, you know, you need to be more patient. Uh, what, the, what, what actually, when I started getting into wildlife and sort of nature photography, that's sort of when I, I learned sort of patience because the act of taking, a lot of people say that, you know, when you take pictures, you're too busy taking photographs and you're not, you're not seeing what you're actually shooting. For me, it's been the other way around. Uh, the act of taking photographs sort of has made me sort of really connect a little bit more to, uh, to, 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 the, to the, world, the world of nature. I, I'm, I'm more patient and more able to sit in one place and observe for hours at a time in order to, to sort of get the, good, the right photograph. So in many ways, sort of my, 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 my journey in sort of nature, in nature photography and in, in nature and uh, being a nature enthusiast in, in general is, is fairly linked to my photography as well. In fact, I met Nick for the first time in 2005 or 2006 in Bandagur. I was, in a, I was leading a photography workshop and Nick, were, Nick and Shella were there. And then we sort of met and we had, we had a coffee and we hit it off together. So anyway, so let's get started. So what I want to do is sort of introduce you to the underwater world, sort of, you know, what it's like, what are some of the things you'll see, what makes it so interesting. And, you know, why, is, why, why I, I mean, I think that diving is the most amazing thing you can do. Uh, and sort of, you know, hopefully if, if you come out of this with a, with, with a sense of excitement about the underwater world, then we're in good shape. So let me get this thing started. Uh, okay, guys, so apparently I cannot share guys so just one second let me just check that yeah <clears throat> so but guys at any point while we're having this talk if there's something you find interesting just you know feel free to interrupt me and and, and we can uh, we can talk about it yeah this is no this is not a very formal session so try now but that you should be able to share. Yes. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think um, I like like most people. I started doing doing wildlife photography, right? Because that, you know, you, you, when you when you start, you know, you, tigers are cool. You you, you know, whatever shooting. The problem I always faced with wildlife is with wildlife photography, at least in India, is that you know you're in a jeep. Your, what you shoot is, is, a, is a matter of like what, if you're, what route has been assigned to you, what the jeep in front of you is doing, and what the animal is doing. So, you know, you are basically, you don't have a lot of creative focus to create, to some extent, to, your creativity is, is limited to a large extent by uh, external circumstances, right? If your jeep is third in line, you're not going to get a good tiger shot. Uh, if you're you know, in the wrong route, it doesn't really matter. You can't, you can't stay and wait for the tiger to sort of uh, do something interesting or, or something different or something uh, Photograph worthy. Underwater is a bit different. Underwater is a you know big big. It's, it's uh it's a lot, you have a lot of freedom in sort of what what you shoot. Uh, so when I started out, I got underwater camera and I was like, wow, I'm I'm diving for the entire one hour shooting. There's something to shoot for the entire time, right? Uh, do any guys go on safaris? Yeah. Uh, hi, Vinny. What I'm doing is I put the chat off. We okay. don't want people disturbing while the talk is on. So okay. once the talk finishes, we keep a chat on for everything else. But till okay, then, chat is on. Okay, so okay, so fine. So guys, when you go on, when you, if, if I were to go on to, to a safari to let's say Corbett, which is a very high biodiversity park, right? Uh, how many species of mammals do you think you can see? Maybe five, six. You see elephant, you see types of deer, uh, maybe lucky a tiger or whatever. Anytime you die, you you can you're actually looking you're looking at seeing maybe 100, 150, 200 species at a given time. And it's not just, you know, 
in, in you, you, you see for half an inch, one species, the entire dye that you the water is surrounded by species, right? So, so, so then what that is, so where there's little stuff like, where there's little stuff like the gobi, which is about, the size, about maybe two and a half inches in, in size, and I didn't, they hide in the crestes and rocks and pearl. Or there's something, you know, you guys have all seen the uh, Nemo's, right? Clownfish. Or something like grouper, something about five, six feet in size. So the entire time you're diving, you're pretty much surrounded by wildlife for the entire du duration of the dive. The first thing is when you're on the water, just the amount of stuff you see. If you dive one hour, in that one hour you have a headache. There's stuff, there's stuff there, there's stuff all uh, around sorry, you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Bandit, we're having some issue with the with your audio. Okay. You're break, breaking up and coming. Can you just... Uh, Check your broadband. Can everybody else please put your videos off so we have enough broadband? Okay. Sorry, I, th I think uh, my internet seems to have got it slower after the lockdown, the lockdown unfortunately. Okay, it's better now. So let's better? start. Okay. So. Then so so I, I first started out sort of you know with with a, what like how most people do with a compact camera started taking some pictures and I got shots like this but then underwater photography once you underwater especially photography it's uh, it's very really equipment intensive right to get uh, for a bunch of reasons uh, you need lot you need like powerful lights you need a wide ultra wide angle that's on so forth so that obviously that's how I made I made the jump as you know, I this is I'm really enjoying what I'm doing so let's, let's do this here's an example of what I mean on a given day you know if you look here. Uh, you, have, you have this big school of 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 of, of, uh, um, of jacks uh, 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 jacks here. You. You, if, if you've got the right set of skin, there's probably seven or eight different species of fish that you see floating around. So if you want to see fish, you look up. If you look at the coral on the, on, on, on the bottom right, if you get closer... Uh, to the one did, one did, sorry. Yeah. Your audio is not clear. You keep breaking up. I don't know. Uh, can you do something with that? I unfortunately you... not do it. Could you could you maybe log in again? You just log out, log in again because yeah, sure, sure. yeah, sure. Because your uh, voice is cracking and breaking, we can't hear you. Okay. okay, so let me then. I'll just reset my router. Yeah, give me a second. Yeah, we are waiting. Yeah, so we'll just wait for a minute. He'll just re-logging again. Okay, hopefully it's a bit better now. Yeah, sounds sounds better. Okay, fingers crossed it stays like this now. <laughs> Maybe if you wear headphones, it might be clearer sound. If you have some, some... I don't have. Uh... Okay, fine. This is good. This is good. Then we're good to go. No. So, like I said, you know, once you once you start getting underwater, you have a, your your choice of there's just a lot more to see. It's just a matter of sort of what your focus is. Do you want to look up? Do you want to look ahead? Or do you want to look down? And the, sub the subject changes there. Here's an ex another example, right? So, of just the, if you just look at, just see the amount of amount of different species that's available, as you can see in one shot. 
this in, in a nutshell is the difference between sort of uh, being one of the big differences between sort of what it's like being underwater versus on land. This is, a, I mean, uh, if I know, for, for example, you guys, are, I mean, if you're birders, right, you go, if you go on a trip and you have, you check out about 150, 200 species on, on, a, on a trip, that's a great trip. Um, there are a lot of people who are, the, the fish, like, equivalent of that is, is fish identification. You can check up a hundred species in a given dive. Actually, if you're if you if you pay, if you're into if you're into uh, into this sort of stuff, which a lot of people are. Here's an example. You know, just, just, as you can see, sort of you know, there's just lots of stuff to see. And then the other thing that also that, that the good thing about diving is that you know it's um, it, it's it is a three dimensionality to it. On land, you sort of you know you're we, we can't fly, so we're stuck on, on on the ground unless you're shooting with a drone. Everything that you shoot is sort of going to be ground-based. Um, underwater, because you can sort of you can go up and down a little bit as well. There's a three you, there's a three dimension chance you can go up and get a bird's eye view. You can come down and get a snail's eye view. For example, when I took this shot, I was I stayed in this one place for an entire one hour, waiting to get the right sort of a nice clean shot with with just one diver, no fish, and just an, absolutely just a clean image. And this is with me lying on my back and shooting completely up, uh, vertically up, up, up. And this is a, here's another example of sort of this. In this case, I'm sort of you know, uh, the, the bottom was actually about 20 meters below me. The, just in front, where this ends, there's a, there's a cliff. So here's me sort of floating in the middle of the water and trying to get a diver swimming through another, another cliff. So again, so depending on sort of whether interest is photography or or, or just like or, or wild or just marine life, this you can, you can really. Uh, Structure your dive according to your interests. There's, there's a lot to sort of, you, you can do it exactly what you want. It's not like in a, in a, in a, in a safari where you're in a, in a car just driving out and back, out and back, or whatever. Here's an example of sort of, you know, I went to Raja Ampat, one of the most amazing places to dive, highest biodiversity in the world, actually. 13, 1400 species of marine life. So these are glass fish, they schooling fish, they grow, they, 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 when fish are spawned, they, 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 they find a shell, they're usually a rock or something, and until they get a bit bigger. Once they reach a certain size, then they sort of disperse. So during this time, they actually really easy prey for predators. So they, they school in large numbers and to, to hide, to do so for protection rather. So here, you know, you can, so this, I spent about, again, about 30, 40 minutes in one place just trying to shoot these from different angles. You know, they, as the fish were like a river, they go left, they go right. In this case, as they turn left, all of them sort of form a uniform appearance. Then they turn the other way. And then I waited to get a diver in the frame and sort of got, got the whole image sort of balanced off. And you can see there's one cheeky little grouper in the middle here, sort of right there, trying to get in on the action as well. So, so and then, the, the th and the other thing is, it doesn't have to be super exotic, right? You don't have to go into, in, like, into, like a, into someplace exotic to see marine life. Now, this is in a jetty. Uh, you can just jump in the water, and right off the, off, off the water, you see, you see three, three, four different types of coral. You see some, uh, you see some, some sergeant majors. And if you if you're willing to spend the time and and, and look at sort of uh, at uh, and work your subject, so you know I, I saw this fish, I, I saw this the red coral in the fish, and I go, this is a nice nice shot. I want to get a better shot. And I turn and just as I took the photo, the fish turned away. So I have the, I have the tail of the fish. Okay, I'm going to stick spend some time more here. And then the, the guy came to me towards the camera. So this he's actually coming because I was, I was in in place. I was not moving too much. He could see his reflection in my camera. So he was very intrigued. So he came right against my camera. You can see him, he's about maybe two inches away from my camera port. And then sort of shooting up, I managed to get a sunburst and the fish at the right angle and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and this is something, again, I would not have been able to do if I was in a, uh, in, you know, in, in, a in a terrestrial environment. So, because you, you, you can't sit in one, one hour, you can't go up and down, you can't go, you know, 10 feet above your Jeep to take a photo, right? So, and then, so this, these, these are fish, but, and the, the thing is now, uh, um, yeah, Pradumna. Go ahead, ask your question. Sure, sure. Go ahead, ask your question. Um, nobody can ask a question. When did we close the chat? Okay, okay, fine. Uh, someone raised their hand, so I was wondering. No, 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 they can't ask the question. Now we'll do it at the end of the uh, talk. We'll ask questions. Okay, okay. Pradumna, save, save your question. We'll get to it at the end, yeah? Yes, yes. Okay. So now, the thing is now, the, the, to me, actually, when you, when, you, when, you think is, when, you, when you think of fish, right? The, you, yes, they're colorful. The fish are pretty standard, right? There's a certain shape that might be, it might vary in terms of color, etc. But where the ocean gets really interesting is once you start getting into the little stuff, like it's called macro. So, for example, this is, this is a, a typical type of scorpion fish. 
I think they blend really well with environments. And you can see now you're starting to get to marine life that does not look normal. It's not something that you're using in sort of in your in your, in your daily life. It's called it's a scorpion fish. It's it's um, found in certain parts of Indonesia. Uh, it's, this is Ranopia. It's a it's a lead scorpion fish. It's, 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 and here's a different version of that. If you just if you can see the eyes, you can see the camouflage, you can see the colors. You know, it's, it, these are like tripping. Once you into macro, you can actually spend your entire life and not see even a fraction of the species that are out there. <coughs> Pygmy seahorses are about. Um, if you if you take a, if you if you cut your nails, if you cut the nail from your little finger, the piece that you cut, that's how big these things are. So for spotting them is a challenge, right? Uh, and they sort of, they, they, uh, once you get, you have to get really close to them to observe them and you do it for a second and you can't find them again. So they're that tiny. But again, you can, just, you can see different species of this, the same species, this one's a different species. <clears throat> you can see how well they blend into the, into the, into the coral. So I, like I said, to, to give you, this, is, this whole thing is about maybe half a centimeter in size. There's the seahorse in, in the picture. And you get these like orangutan. It's a, it's a crab. It, it's got like sort of hairy arms, hence the name. Uh, eels. So this is a, called a river eel. So the, the, the interesting thing about eels, when you see them, you know, they're always opening and closing their mouth. I don't know if you've seen that National Geographic shows. Uh, it, it looks quite threatening. They're trying to bite me or whatever. Actually, the reason that is they, that's how they breathe. They take the air from the mouth and force it out of the gills. So it's actually they breathe. So when you see an eel doing this, it's not like sort of making a threatening display. It's just breathing. It's doing its own thing. Uh, so this is and uh, this is called a mantis shrimp. So and you know here's a close up of what his look what what his eyes look like. Look at the eyes. Look at how sort of textured the eyes are. The eyes are the round parts up here. Uh, and the, this is the cause. The interesting thing about mantis shrimp that if you if, if you were to blow them up to Mike Tyson's size, they'd be the one of the strongest punchers in the world. So the way the way they hunt is that they have little, little things here. If you can see in this, like this orange part below, sitting uh, hold it down. The, the way they actually reach out and punch, and the concussive force of the punch knocks the prey out and basically stops prey, and they go catch it. Um, there have been cases of the mantis ships coming really close to divers and actually uh, divers coming really close to mantis shrimp, and the mantis ship punches them and actually breaks their mask. That's how much force it has in the punch. So if you get a mantis ship that's sort of super sized and it's in a heavyweight boxing contest, always pick the mantis ship. And the other thing is even like octopi, right? Octopi is super cool. Um, and it's much, it, 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 the thing is once I started sort of, I like eating octopi, but then the, once I started seeing them in the water, I realized how, 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 how interesting they are. They're super intelligent. Uh, you when you're in the water, sometimes if you, if you, if you come close to them in a non-threatening man, they will interact, they will play with you. I've, sometimes you do take your finger out, the octopi will reach out to the tail and sort of lock its finger, its tail fingers, you and so on so forth. Super smart and uh, great fun to watch as well because you see them change color like in an instant. Like it, it, this this thing went from white to the reddish of the background in about maybe one second. And on the right, you can actually see a shrimp as well, right next to the to the octopus. And uh, speaking about shrimps, these are called bubble. These are called an, uh, anemone shrimps, peppermint shrimps, and these are found in in soft coral like the. Each of these coral bubbles that you see is about the size of your fingertip. So you can get a sense of how big that shrimp is. It's tiny. It's a, it's a really, if, you, if you're not looking at fish, you want to look at uh, look in coral. It's an amazing wealth of the stuff that you see in there. Like this, this crab in here. It's found buried in the ground. You have to be very careful when you see it. You'll just see so it's up, curled up in the in all there. Sorry, but if your voice is cracking up a little bit, is Again, it possible for you to just come closer to the mic while speaking? Maybe that would... Yeah, 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 sure. Let me try. Is that better? Yep, seems to be better. Thanks. Okay, so I'll just I'll just uh, get really close. Here. Now these these this is a family of uh, species of animal called a nudibranch. The name is it comes from uh, it is German for external gill. So you guys see this stuff in the middle. That's, that's gills of the animal. So that's how it breathes. The gills are on the outside. Now the thing with nudibranchs is there's so many. The variety is more than 50% of the species don't even have a name yet. They're just formal species that are discovering new species even now, uh, and they, they, they haven't been classified yet. So you, can, you could very well find a nudibranch and have it named after you. The, the, the Devasa nudibranch, for example. 
Um, and they, again, they come in an immense variety, like you see, immense variety of colors, sizes. They're all typically very small, maybe about the size of your little finger, or maybe even smaller. Um, here's another one, for example, you can see the, 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 the tentacles and the, the horns in the front. And in the back bird, you can see the, the gills. And you're first different types of crabs, these are porcelain crabs, and of course, everyone's favorite males. Then they have a really cute expression. The interesting thing about mores is they're actually not very aggressive, but to, to, because of, when they're beating you, and if, if they get threatened, they can sometimes come out and bite. And they're really sharp teeth. So you have to be very careful about mores. Just because they, they're docile in my own business, uh, you should never push them too much. Actually, it's too many things, right? And you should not be harassing any wildlife, be it in a, in a national park outside or underwater. Uh, so you underwater because you know, uh, you don't get the same supervision. You're not in a jeep. You don't have a forest department guard sitting next to you. Uh, you have a lot of freedom underwater. And that means the freedom comes with responsibility to actually be careful and be and, and, and pay attention to the environment. And now let's do short. Let's just a little. Now let's talk about the. So it's Nikhil and I. Many years ago, we had gone to Thailand. Uh, Nikhil, Nikhil was with a bird, bird uh, a hawk census. And I was like, I have nothing better to do, so I'll come with you. So after we did the, the, the hawk sense, I mean, let's go, let's do some dives. So there's a, there's a I go out, and uh, at this one side, they started discovering bull sharks. Now, the interesting, you guys all heard about bait whites, right? And the bait whites have this thing of being dangerous so to, 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 to divers and so on and so forth. I, let me take a step back. Sharks are not dangerous. Um, what happens a lot, you people don't get eaten by sharks. We are not natural prey species for sharks because you know sharks. Generally, um, what happens is that in 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 poor poor visibility or whatever, a shark might actually accidentally bite us. What happens? The, the way sharks, you know how do you how, how do you care about something? You touch it, right? You care, you put your hand, you touch it to get a sense of what it is. Sharks do that by biting. So that's how they figure out what it is. If they just come across something unfamiliar, they mouth it. It's like your puppy like getting what is this? They mouth things. The problem is that if, 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 if a lot of people get bitten, by, they don't get eaten by sharks, they get accidentally bitten by sharks. Imagine this, you're swimming in, 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 in murky waters, a shark is swimming by, it feels your vibration, it comes to you like, hey, what is this? One dip, one dip. Uh, totally breaking up, we can't understand anything. Do you think you can maybe okay, walk with your laptop towards the router? Would that help? Uh, the router is about, you know, okay, let me see, I'm about now three feet I from the router. Yeah, it's, everything is breaking up. We can't hear you. Okay, is this better? Okay, sure. All right, let's try this. So, uh, so anyway, as I was thinking about sharks, is that uh, the, it's a popular misconception that sharks are actually dangerous. Sharks don't eat people. Most of the shark attacks that happen are accidental. Obviously, as I was saying, a shark, the way a shark investigates the world around it is by mouthing. They don't have hands. Uh, so they, 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 they just bite them with the teeth to see what it is. So when you're in the water and in, in, in let's say murky water and a shark doesn't know what you will come and just take a just bite to see what you are and it and it goes ew and it spits you out and swims away. Unfortunately, you know the, the, the act of a shark biting you is what typically leads to it leads to blood loss and then uh, possible fatalities. But even then, there's you know the, the number of people that get by get, get attacked by sharks maybe eight or ten a year. There's eight or ten fatalities a year. So sharks and we on the other hand, humans kill about 350 million sharks a year. It's crazy how sort of how how dangerous humans are to sharks rather than the other way around. When you dive with sharks in clear water, you realize that sharks are absolutely not dangerous. If they can see what you are, they don't care because sharks have have been around for 200 250 million years, and they've not changed. So they, they know this is food, this is a potential mate, this is a potential threat. We fall in either category. So for the most part, sharks leave divers alone. And one of the most amazing things you'll see in the water is like you see a shark swimming, you know, a big 300, 400 kilo fish moving its tail just an inch and gliding faster than you can swim. That's one of the most, absolutely the most amazing sights you can see underwater. It's, to me, it's the equivalent of seeing a tiger. A tiger. It just it changes your life. And once you dive with sharks, you, you want to dive with them again and again and again. So anyway, so Nikhil and I, we, there's, a, we, there's a site which, which has bull sharks. Now, bull sharks are the ones that actually have the most number of attacks to humans, not because they're aggressive, but bull sharks are the ones that you find in really shallow water. 
Uh, if you invest deep water in Florida, you'll see a bull shark, like an eight foot bull shark swimming in there. Uh, and, if you guys, and bull sharks, the only sharks can come into fresh water. So if, you, I don't know if you guys have heard stories about sharks in the Ganges. Those are bull sharks. So bad visibility and a propensity to be where humans are is the reason why bull sharks have a lot of uh, uh, a, 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 you know, unfortunate uh, incidents with humans. It's not that they're more aggressive. But they're also amazing sharks to see because they're, they're, they're really big. And as the name implies, you know, they're, they're very thick. So they're like a shark on steroids, right? Um, and we see them in the water. They have this presence. They're like the local gundas. They're like, oh, they're like yeah, this is not going to mess you up, huh? So Nick and I, we went to see bull sharks at this site. And um, so we went down. It was really actually very poor visibility. Uh, this species is kind of you know, not the kind of right visibility to be in the water with bull sharks. So anyway, he and I in the water, and we, we kept a back to the and we could see a couple of bull sharks sort of circling around. And so they, both Nick and I get a better look, and so we swam out a little bit further, and we realized there was a bit of a current taking us away from the reef. So after five minutes, I look back, see the reef, and there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no reef around us. Like, oops. And I can see the sharks sort of going around us, going around us. So that's when we sort of beat a hasty retreat back to the reef, so be, because uh, obviously, Bad bees and bull sharks are a bad combination to be. So these are, what, what you see in the photo here are called left sharks. So this is also in Thailand. It's a, this photo here is, a, the, the, I think, the only recorded photographs of leopard shark eating, I believe. So I was swimming along at about 25 meters. I look way below me and I see these two sharks sort of swimming around and around. Uh, and being, being, I mean, I probably shouldn't have gone that deep, but I dropped about 50 meters to take this photograph. Um, and if it's a, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking a shot, I'm about maybe one foot away from the sharks. I'm shot with a fisheye lens. So they're circling around. After I took the shot, the shark on top actually turned around, its tail hit me in the face, slapped me across my ear, and I dislodged my mask on my face. And the shark absolutely didn't care. They, they did not, the fact that it hit me didn't even register. They're too busy sort of in the main ritual or whatever. So anyway, so this is an interesting sort of uh, experience I had. Manta rays, everyone's favorite, uh, one of the most, again, one of the most sort of highlights of any diving, uh, diving trip. Uh, these can be about, they go up to about four or five meters in size. These are, are, are uh, medium size, they're, they're not oceanic mantas, they're reef mantas. So they're about two, three meters, still pretty large. And typically you find, you get close to mantas in the place where there's a lot of current because the current brings nutrients and what the, that brings the mantas food, or it's a place where there's a cleaning station. So this is a cleaning station. So what happens here is the mantas come in and they hover on top of the coral and these small fish come up and they clean the gills. So it's an interesting way, it's, it's, it's symbiosis. So what the, for, for the mantas, it gets its gills clean and you don't get, they, they sort of, they, they, it, it gets rid of parasites and things that might be infections. And for the fish, it's a great way to get a snack. You know, it's delivery. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the zomato of the underwater world. The manta comes to you and it stays there and you, you, it's like a buffet. You eat what you want and you move off. The next manta comes. It's pretty cool. So here there's a pretty strong current and you can see like this, this is one guy with a video in the back taking photographs and me hovering on the side. And you can see everyone in a line in the back sort of holding on because there's a strong current. So I was looking here in this man, I actually got quite curious, I think, because with the camera, they can sometimes see the reflection on the lens. So this came actually so close to me that the bubbles that you see in the top right are my bubbles going up. So the lens is actually so close. It's winged again in the face on my side as I was taking the picture. Life-changing experience, guys, being with these things. They're like, they're like giants. They're, 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 it's like, like birds, right? They're, they're so graceful and, uh, and immensely. The size is amazing as well. It uh, changes your perspective. Um, another interesting thing to shoot on, uh, on what is, is turtles. Turtles are super cool. Um, so the, the thing is now, turtles actually breathe air, right? So they, they, they don't, they, they don't, uh, they, 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 not, they don't breathe water. So they have to keep coming up for breath every 10, 15, 30 minutes, depending on how, how busy they're in. They're also pretty aggressive at, when it comes to eating, uh, eat, eating coral. What you see on the left, that red thing is called a bar sponge. And it's a favorite stack for green turtles. So this, this turtle, in fact, they, 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 this one side, they have a lot of bar sponges. They have a lot of turtles as well. And generally with turtles is when you, if you swim up to them, they swim away, right? They don't know what you are. They're a bit defensive. But if you approach them carefully, so don't swim right to it, turn around sideways. Do, don't be threatening. It's gradually, it can be quite curious as well. This turtle was about five or six feet from me when I was taking his picture. And he started swimming towards me. So, of course, I turned, I, and I changed my profile to be less threatening. And he got really curious and he came up to me. 
He came closer and he came even closer. This is him right pretty much nose to nose against my camera, trying to see, hey, what's going on here? Right. And, I, and I, again, guys, just look around, just see the amount of light there is on the sea, right? all the fish all around and stuff like that. It's <laughs> and then, the, then he went up to breathe. And then I got this shot as well of sort of you know, in, the, in the silhouette. Anyway, so now what did you want to leave you with? Just, uh, 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 just talk a little bit about the photography side. There's a very famous photographer called Galen Rowell. Um, he died, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s in a plane crash. And there's a really nice photo, Rainbow of Patala. That's, that's, about, that, that's, that's taken by him. So he had this uh, really interesting theory in photography. So when it's a new subject, right? Um, and it, just even a clean shot of, 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 of uh, they take, uh, even a clean shot is nice. If you think about wildlife photography 30, 40 years ago, a clean photograph of a tiger would be pretty impressive. A clean photograph of a lion was very impressive. But then once started, people started taking that, then the photography evolved. Then it went from being a portrait to a habitat shot, showing the animal, its environment, showing behavior. And then it evolved beyond that as well to what's to like almost what's called fine art photography, right? So where you have the design elements that you would have in let's say the, of, of fine art photography, but applied to nature. So that to me, I think a lot of photography is now to progress to the point where you know, you're not just shooting, okay, look, oh, look, this is a fish, or look, this is a turtle, or, or look, this is a shark. You're trying to move into more sort of shapes, sizes, colors, textures, and so on and so forth. So, so that, and again, one thing that draws me to underwater photography is that you have a lot more freedom. That you, you can go up, down, you can choose to stay in one place. You have a lot of compositional freedom how you choose a shot. So I'll just show you a couple, of, a couple of examples of what I mean there. So here's, here's a case of like a, 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 there's a rock and there's glass fish around it. And normally all the fish are underneath. <clears throat> but what was happening at that point was there was a trivalli hunting them. So as the trivalli were hunting, they were coming out, going above, and trivalli was on top coming below. So it's sort of circling this, 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 this cropping coral uh, around. So I saw them like, okay, this is quite interesting. So I'm going to, st I stayed in this place for pretty much 40 minutes. Just waiting for it to, to for, for a nice pattern to happen, and then I got a shot which I'm quite happy with. Find a little bit of wave swimming out with some fish around it, but anyway. And this is a, this is a lionfish. Lionfish, um, you see the, the spines on the back are quite venomous. This fellow is actually not very really happy to see me. He sort of turned and he's showing me his spines. This is a threat display. It's like, hey, buddy, you're bothering me. And the reason it's bothering him was I actually wanted to get a shot off of the lionfish. Uh, right, right next to the jetty, right, right against the island, with the with the with the sh with the shallow top. So it's fairly shallow. I wanted to get sort of show the habitat that it's. This is not necessarily something that you have to go in exotic waters to find. This is not find any right. Uh, in I'm in Chennai. You can see you you can see fish species like this go out by boat for about five minutes, and you can see a lot of marine species like this as well. So so yeah. So so I I was shooting up and trying to get the shack, and then the lionfish got a bit tired of sort of me trying to get angles sort of gave me his spine. I think it also looks like it's a nice little, sort of, the black and white also makes a nice sort of a moodiness to, uh, to, to the shot. So here on the, on what you see on the right, the guys is what's called a, uh, a wagon. It's a, it's a type of shark. They're really flat sharks. So they're almost like sharks that have been sort of, you know, <laughs> off right. Uh, and they usually find them either on rocks or sitting on top of corals like this. And after a while, you go, this is not the most exciting shot. It's a flat shot which, which matches the environment. So how do you, what can you do with it right, in terms of photography? So here's what you can do with it. You know, you go up on, this is what I mean about sort of three dimensionality. If I could stay in the same place, I'd only get a shot like this. But because I cannot go above the animal, I can get a shot like this. It's a little bit more sort of, you know, interesting, at least for me it is. Then a different variation of the same shot taken in a different angle, different light and so on and so forth. And this, this for me is an example of what, how amazing the underwater world can be. It just, it just, this is fish just as far as I can see, there's fish. You can't see fish because there's other fish blocking your view. And you just go down and just see how many layers of fish there are on this dive. It's crazy. So that's that in a nutshell is sort of, you know, the, 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 what, what makes the underwater world so exciting. What happened was I basically I learned to dive when I was 18 years old. I was in, I was in college and that's when I started diving. Then uh, I, 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 was, I was living in the U.S. I used to do a lot of cold water diving. And then uh, I came to the Andamans back in 2000 uh, on holiday. I really liked the place and I ended up getting my job moving back to India from the U.S. and starting a dive center there. 
Uh, and then basically yes, I spent about 19 years, so from 2016 years living there, from 2003 to 2019. So I, I even met that. This is a photo of my golden retriever. We used to go out on the beach every evening looking for marine life. You don't necessarily have to see marine life, right? With all the, even the shallow, the shallow pools would have, have, have a good amount of marine life. Like, here's my Labrador Sam and the wool field. So just in about six inches of water right next to shore. And here's Frodo with an octopus stuck on his nose. Yes, that really is an octopus. He was sniffing, he grabbed his nose. And then he looked really like, what the hell happened? And finally, I, I, I pried the octopus off. It went in the water, swam off. And Frodo was like, what, what, what just happened here? So the point is that, you know, you don't have to get, uh, get you know, super, uh, the, the ocean is super accessible. And all this stuff, you, you go out in a, in a, in a lagoon or, or, uh, or shallow water pools, and you can see some amazing marine life there itself. Um, yeah, so hopefully this gives you an idea of sort of, you know, what, what, what makes the underwater world so exciting. Um, any questions? So let's give up the questions. Anything you guys would like to ask? So there's one question actually I get asked a lot is, sort of, you know, how, how easy is this for people to, 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 to access? Okay, Vinny, I've been diving now for almost 30 years. Well, what about, say, someone who's, who's, who's not willing to quit his job and become a diver? Yeah. What are the opportunities for some for for, for that? Um, diving is super accessible. You don't have to be a, a a great swimmer. You don't have to be a great athlete. In fact, in, it's actually technically speaking, it's not an adventure sport. It's it's it's, it's a recreational activity. Uh, the safety in terms of diving safety, you have a greater chance of getting injured while swimming. You have a greater chance of getting injured while snorkeling, uh, and you have a, uh, than, than diving. So it's super safe. You need to know basic swimming for sure. But you have to, as long as you're over 10 years old and, and reasonably good, good physical condition, you can dive. It takes about one and a half, two days to actually go through the skills and theory you need. And right after that, you can jump in the ocean and, and, and do it and, and, and start diving and seeing all this stuff. And this is not stuff that you have to go to exotic locations like Africa or whatever. This is stuff that you can see on almost any dive in any dive location anywhere in the world. So that's, that's the amazing thing about the sport. So with that said, now, let, let's, let, 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 let's turn the field over, Nick. So I think I saw some raised hands. So can we get into q yes, so we have opened the chat box now. So anybody okay. can now ask the question they want in the chat. Okay. So let me stop the sharing yes. here for a second. Oh. Oh, stop share. And let me pull up the chat box. Okay. So <laughs> while we have the questions coming in, we can maybe just ask the question of the day to our viewers. So I'll just share my screen and then one bit you can ask the question to the viewers. Sure. So, by the way, guys, inter interesting thing about that. If you're into underwater photography, can I just go back to the previous shot for a second, Kavi? Kavi? So that one with my, the, the one with, yeah. So usually what, what's really helpful with photography is, is we're taking pictures is having a model in the shot. Uh, so my model in this case happens to be my, my, my long suffering wife who has been trained by use of hand, hand signals to know where to position herself, where to look and so on and so forth. So on this dive, what I actually wanted, uh, she, didn't, she wasn't diving on this dive. She, she, was, she was not feeling well. So there's, there's another guy on the, on the boat and he had, his wife was his model. So she was posing for him on this shot and I shamelessly barged in and sort of went to his side and, and got the shot. And I think I got a better angle than he did actually. But... <laughs> So because when we came up, his, uh, his wife was giving me, he was teasing me in a good natured way. Bad enough that I have one photography uh, bully and I don't need two. But anyway, so. Yeah. Right, one, do you want to ask this to our viewers? Maybe you can just give some yes, context yes. as well. So guys, so yeah, I mean, you know, so we've been talking about this now, now hopefully like, um, uh, the reason I mean, I'm, I'm comparing it to, to, to uh, I've been talking a little bit about underwater versus terrestrial is not too much, so much because to show it's better, but just because many people probably have a familiarity of what it's like to, to go on a safari or to go to a national park. So I'm just, uh, the reason I'm doing the comparison is to give you a sense of contrast between the two. But so anyway, so if, uh, Zeiss, is, Zeiss has been kind enough to sponsor a little, a, a little prize for this today's session. So if you guys can mention five differences between an underwater nature experience and a terrestrial one, and uh, the best answer will get either a binocular harness or a Zeiss, Zeiss cleaning kit. You can pick whichever one you want. So you can message that to Nick and then we'll pick, pick out the answer. Yep. So you can, you can just go to delibirdfoundation.org slash contest and uh, submit your answers over there. 
all the answers will be forwarded to Vandit and he'd be choosing the best answer and the best answer will get the prize. Nick, do you want to take questions? Okay, so hi Vandit, Shela here. Hey Shela. So there are some questions coming in. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you've got a lot of people interested in diving um, with those beautiful photographs and your stories. Um, so one big question is, what's your dive center called? <laughs> Thank you. So we're called Dive India. Okay. Yeah, so the okay. website is diveindia.com. And you're based in the Andaman. Yeah, so we have two dive centers in the Andamans. We also have training locations in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, and Chennai. Well, we do normally when there isn't a, a, a pandemic happening. So whenever things start again, we'll have training there. So someone, someone actually asked, how do, I, how do you get kids, how do you get into kids into diving, etc. So there's, there's, two, there's two ways you can actually get into the sport. One is called what's called a Discover Scuba Diving, a DSD. A D, that's an intro program. So this is a, it's a good program for someone to get a taste of photography, so a taste of diving. So it's conducted by, a, you, you go out with an instructor, you get a short briefing, and then basically they, they pretty much, it's a one-on-one, -on -one, they hold you around and take you, take you around diving and sort of introduce you to the sport. So it's a good, it's, like I said, it's a good, like a a good taster. This is what the sport is like. The, 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 there is a limitation with DSD, however, is because, because you're not trained, the entire, all the safety falls on the dive center and the dive professional. So DSD is always conducted in sites which are very, very uh, safe, secure, predictable, and shallow. Now, um, which is not to say you can, you, that you can't see stuff. You can see some pretty cool stuff there. But if you really want to start getting to seeing the, really, uh, the amazing stuff like sharks and mantas and turtles and stuff like that, it generally helps to be certified as a diver to get a license. Certification takes about three or four days. Uh, you, take, uh, you, can, you, you complete the theory at home. So you, you basically you go online, there's content there, you complete the content. Uh, these days now, at least a lot of places are doing this, the rest of the theory online as well, so are we. In fact, I just finished a theory session with some dive masters before this. Then the second part of the, uh, of the training is what's called confined water skills or skill development. So here in a swimming pool or shallow water, you practice the skills. You practice all the essential skills you need to actually get, uh, become to be, to, to be, get comfortable, you know, manipulating your equipment emergency skills, swimming skills, etc. Then the third part is what the practical side. We actually do, you do four dives in the ocean. Some of the dives, a few minutes of these, you'll actually spend practicing the skills again. And the other time you just swim around, look at stuff and you see all the stuff that I showed you in the photo. At the end of the course, you get a license. Once you have the license, you can go diving anywhere in the world. You go to a dive center, show them your license and you can dive. And the more you dive, obviously the more, more stuff that you see and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, uh, and someone's asking what sort of medical condition and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. there, is, there is a bunch of, in general, you need to be in good physical health in order to dive. Uh, most, there are quite a few medical issues which, which, um, which mean, it doesn't mean you cannot dive. You do need to speak to a doctor and you need to get a doctor to advise you on how to, how to, how to manage the condition in the context of diving. So there's only very few issues that actually absolutely contra, uh, contraindicate diving. So yeah, so for, for the most part, unless you have like, like especially heart issues or epilepsy or a few other like really major things, from, if you can exercise, if you can run for a little bit, or if you can, you know, uh, if, you, if you can play golf for, few, for an hour or for a couple of hours, you can dive. What about high blood pressure? Someone does. So again, high blood pressure depends again on what the cause of the blood pressure and how it's managed. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is possible to dive with it, yes. But you will need to, you do need to speak to your doctor and just and, and discuss the issues with them. So if so generally what happens is when you when you sign up for a diving course, you, you get sent a medical form. And then you, you look at the questions. If you answer yes to all the questions, if you answer no to all the questions, sorry, you can dive. If you answer yes to any of them, then you have to you have to take you have to discuss it with your with your uh, physician who can then inform you whether or not it's an issue. So in and, general uh, if, if, if yeah. conditions under control, typically it's not an issue. And how much, how expensive is it to dive? I mean, is it, is it an expensive hobby to get into? It's, yeah, it's not the cheapest hobby, to be honest. Um, I mean, typically, let's say, a, 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 I mean, learning to dive, see, with, as with everything else, the way, the, and, and then this is obviously, a, to, to some extent, it's a, I'm obviously biased because, you know, we, we, we teach diving as well. And I'll be very honest, we're not the cheapest place to, uh, to learn diving. But when it comes to learning diving, the costs range anywhere from 20, 20, 20, 20, 22,000 to 35, 40,000, depending on where you are. 
for example, our diving course is about 26, 27,000 for about four days plus, plus tax. Now, the thing is, you, you can, it's, it's like, it's like a, it's like a wildlife, to use a wildlife analogy, you can go to, you can go to a safari in a canter with 40 other people, or you can go to, you can go, you can have a, a private Jeep with a guy who knows his stuff. It's also the analogy is colleges. You know, you, you, there's, there's different colleges and, you know, uh, you can get an MBA from Harvard. You can get an MBA from some state university in, 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 in Wisconsin or whatever. They're both MBAs, but are they the same? Probably not. So, with the, I mean, learning to dive is not the cheapest thing there is. It's not the most expensive there is. My, my recommendation to people, always, and it's not just whether you dive with us. When you, when you learn to dive, find a good instructor. Find, an, uh, find someone that, that, that's getting quality. Pay, even if you have to pay a little bit extra for good instruction, it's worth it because this is a, that, that instruction that you get, those four days are preparing you for a lifetime in the sport, right? So yeah, this, that's not an area to skim. And then dive holidays, yeah, they, I mean, typically you look for a week long holiday, you're looking at about, starting at about anywhere, depending on 30, 40,000 to 60, 70,000, or depending if you're going to Galapagos, it's, you know, 10, uh, 12 days can be a few lakhs as well. So again, it's a wide range of choices. It's not necessarily that much more expensive than any other holiday, quite honestly. You know, you, if you go to a holiday, you stay, a, a, a normal holiday to Maldives will probably cost more than a liveaboard trip to the Maldives. So, okay. yeah, like I said, it's... And then the, uh, Sneha is asking, uh, is the coral community uh, the most important in the ocean or is that the best, like uh, how, how important are corals <laughs> or the coral community to the ocean? Oh, this is very, very good question, Sneha. So... <clears throat> The thing with the, the corals are the building blocks of, of the ocean, right? Because uh, what happens is that corals provide, among other things, one is they, they provide shelter to a, to a lot of, to a lot of spe like myriad species of reef re re fish and an entire ecosystem of macro critters. Right? So, and so it's, it's, a building, it's, a build, it's a building block of the, of the under, uh, underwater uh, ecosystem, really. When cor if corals die out, if corals get beached, which is actually what's happening in a, lot, in, a lot, in a lot of places in the world. And in fact, if you guys haven't dived, I strongly suggest to you that you that you dive soon, because in another 30, 40 years, we may not have coral left. And so when, when you have coral beaching, what it does is it changes the entire nature of the ecosystem. It, it, uh, a lot of like sort of what's a level one species, the species that rely on coral, die out because of that. And then the layers on top also then, 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 then also, also, also end, up, uh, end, end up dying out. So and once we have a reef that's not healthy, then all the other predators that used to come to that reef to get their food, they lose, they, they lose their prey species as well. So pretty much it, it's, it's, a, it's a building block of a healthy ecosystem. And if coral start, if, if you start losing coral, you lose the ocean. So yeah, and, and unfo the unfortunate part is because of climate change, corals are under threat. And I really, I mean, I, I'm at a loss in what you can do about it because uh, there's not that much uh, uh, other than sort of, sort of being coral change, uh, climate, uh, climate change under control. There's not really that much you can do about it. You're seeing more and more sort of uh, coral beaching events happening over the last 10 years than I did in the 20 years before that. So. And have you seen a lot of that in the Andamans as well? Unfortunately, yes. In 2010, we had a big beaching event that about in shallow water, so less than about 12 to 14 percent, less than uh, at about 14 meters of shallow, there's been like an overwhelming amount of coral bleach. So almost uh, 70, 80 percent of the coral is gone. It's starting to come back now. Uh, but a lot of species that I used to see earlier are, are, are not there anymore, but just simply because the coral that supported them is gone. Um, so, yeah. The second question that Sneha asked is that which is the oldest creature you have seen in the ocean? Huh. A good question, actually. Sneha. I, I'd probably say it's probably a turtle or a mantis. I mean, I've, I've seen some. Uh, I saw a leatherback once in North Andamans while while on a dive safari. And these things go to like get to be really, really old. That this thing was enormous. It was about well over two meters in size. So I think that probably would be the oldest thing I've seen in terms of physiological age. Um, the oldest species on the other hand is sharks. So imagine this, right? Um, sharks today are the exact same animal as they were 250, 300 million years ago. The only difference is that uh, they've gotten a bit smaller. The, mega, the megalodon has, has died out, thankfully. You don't really need a 25 meter shark swimming around. But in terms of sort of uh, size, behavior, etc., sharks are like, you know, they haven't, they haven't evolved at all. So what does it tell you? Perfection, right? A anything that hasn't evolved for 250 million years is as good as it gets. 
that's that's perfection for you in a nutshell right right <laughs> uh, and it's uh, someone is asking that does the camera flash disturb the animals uh, when they're so close to you so it, it it i've never really noticed an animal finching or not because the thing is that it's it's super fast right? it's uh, the, the 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 flash takes about maybe you know like one like a like a fraction of a second and i've never actually seen an animal sort of respond in any way in a negative in a in a negative manner to 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 to, to flashes that said you guys saw the the, the pygmy seahorses that i posted right so with those you have to be really careful because pygmy seahorses are super super let me uh, are super sensitive to temperature so if you get and because so if you get a flash really close to them and you and you take multiple shots you can actually fire them so you have to be careful about sort of not uh, uh, about how frequently you shoot pygmy pygmy seahorses more than flashes i think what 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 i think can disturb animals a bit more is actually uh, uh, the, the 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 lights that you use for night diving and so it's use again it's a good idea to actually use dimmer lights and to point them away from the subject so your the edge of the beam is what's kissing the the the, the, the animal and not the the center of the beam so yeah okay. Uh, do you also see a lot of plastic underwater? Uh, as that you know, that's like one of the topics that everybody's talking about. How there's so much plastic in the ocean. Have you noticed that as well when you go diving? Um, it varies quite a lot from place to place. Actually, in the Andamans, we are we, luckily we don't we see a lot of plastic on the beach, but not so much in the water. Uh, generally, because also the, the, the a lot of plastic. There's a lot of plastic that actually washes up detritus from. Myanmar and Thailand actually you look at the labels a lot of uh, th uh, Thai labels on them off late over the last five years we've seen a bit more plastic from people coming and drinking plastic water bottled water and leaving that leaving the trash there other places like uh, Philippines Indonesia yes you do see you do see a fair amount of uh, plastic uh, pl plastic tra and trash in the water unfortunately uh, and the problem is that the plastic in the water does not look it, 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 it can often look like a sponge especially plastic bags they look a lot like jellyfish and other things. So you have animals coming and eating them, thinking they are food, and then they asphyxiate or they, or they basically have the, it gets caught in the gut and then they die because they can't eat anything else. Yeah. So yeah plastic waste so is pretty bad. I, I think Kavi is interested in diving, but he wants to ask you that how do you ensure that there's no threat from sharks when, when someone goes <laughs> diving with you? Kavi, you, 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 you actually, there's, there, there is no threat from sharks. In fact, you, you, you try your best to go see sharks. Uh, our most pop, we, we run these, uh, we run these what are called outbound trips where we go on diving holidays. We take dive trips across the world. Our most popular trips are the ones where you see sharks. So yeah, <laughs> sharks are friends. <laughs> I mean, as I told you, like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, sharks are really not dangerous. I mean, I, I'd be more worried about sort of, you know, yeah, this, this is probably like a hundred other things I'd be more worried about when I dive rather than sharks. So. Okay, so I think I'll do the last two questions with you. And uh, then, of course, after your fabulous photographs, there are a lot of questions on camera, like yeah. what, what kind of equipment and where yeah. in India would you get good underwater housing? For okay, so, guys, so if you guys, uh, if you guys are interested in cameras, I have, if you go to dive in, uh, our website, diveindia.com, there's a section called library. There's an article section there. I have an article and video which actually talks to the different components of an underwater photography system. Um, while we're talking, I'm going to try to dig up that link and, and try to put it online and put it in the comment section so you guys can see it. So you guys can look through that and that'll give you a good idea of what equipment that you need. At the basic, you can get started with a GoPro. You know, that lets you take what I call record shots. Okay, I saw this, I have a photo of this. But really underwater to take good photographs, you need, to take, you, you need, uh, you need lights. We have a really, really another very, very uh, good un underwater photographer, Umid, who's in the, who's uh, who's in the chat as well. Umid's also one of the he's probably more dedicated to underwater photography than my lazy ass. Um, to, and, and Umid will also very, will, will will vouch for this as well that underwater photo as with all photography, like it's about light. And underwater, because the light is quite poor, you really have to bring your own light with you. So it's it's uh, it's very equipment intensive. Light and for lighting doesn't get cheap, right? The, the better light you want, it, it starts adding up quite fast. So generally what I recommend to people is get, get something like an Olympic, Olympus TG5 with the housing and, and get started with that. Add one light, add a second light. And then as you sort of run through the limits of the camera, then expand more, expand more, expand more. Because if you just jump into a full on underwater camera system right away, you're looking at about at least three lakhs or so in, in expenses. And not only that, uh, keep it, it's, it's not so easy to use, right? Because under, it's not like you're just taking shots. 
underwater, you have to control your, your buoyancy where you are in the water. You have to watch your air supply. You have to make sure you know, you're, you're equalizing your pressure and a whole bunch of things you have to keep track of. So it's not necessarily that just, it's not a matter of buying an expensive camera kit and jumping. You have to develop your skills along with it as well. So yeah, so okay. that's, yeah. So I, I just found the link. Let me just put that up in here for right now for you guys to see. So you, you guys can go through this link and, and, and check and see if you have any questions about the camera system. <laughs> And also, uh, Vandit, as, as the last kind of question, is there is there a season to diving? And can you suggest some books on underwater life? So uh, there's, in terms of season, not so much. It, it varies from place to place, right? For example, for the Andamans, our season tends to be October till about May. Uh, so it really depends on every season when, on what the, what the weather, what the weather and sea conditions are like. So, yeah. If it's if it's tropical and it's monsoon or, or hurricane season, you can't dive anywhere else. You can uh, mm -hmm. some of that. And just in just, just in question about general diving safety and stuff like that, about like pressure and stuff. There are techniques <coughs> to uh, the techniques to manage that. Um, and also narcosis. Someone's asked me narcosis is an issue, not really for depths for the for the depths you would go to as a beginner. Once you're an experienced diver, you're going really deep beyond 30, 35 meters. It can be. A very good question was someone was that whether or not uh, um, it's uh, diving is intrusive to animals or not. It really depends how you do it, right? Because um, it, it, it can be. And honestly, I've seen some incredibly, incredibly sort of people that uh, irresponsible divers. You see, what happens is underwater, you're on your own. No one's supervised. I mean, you're, you have professional supervision. But it's not like the government's not there in the water with you. You don't have like a, a forest department guard watching you and making you, and make sure you behave. So to some extent, you, it really falls upon you to, 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 to make sure that the environment comes first. And I've seen people that, 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 do, not, that do not follow that. Uh, they'll chase animals. They'll, they'll, they'll try to touch things. They'll, and they'll, they'll even hold on to turtles and stuff like that. Uh, good dive centers will not tolerate that at all. Um, unfortunately, some places, you know, you do. You're not so. The, the main thing with diving is you're not supposed to touch animals. You're not supposed to. You know, you're not supposed to disturb the environment. And as long as you do that, pretty much, you know, no animal will let you get within its comfort zone. And the fish consume a lot faster than you. So if you get close to a fish and it doesn't see you, it's going to move away. And unlike the uh, terrestrial terrestrial uh, thing where animals are sitting stationary most of the time, fish are generally moving at all times. So there's always sort of, you know, a predator, potential predator, potential threat happening. So. It's a very fluid environment. So adding a diver in there by itself does not pose much of a disturbance. If the diver is acting irres irresponsibly, like touching things, uh, you know, damaging coral or chasing fish or, or touching turtles, that can be. And that I really, really please, I suggest that, you know, uh, people don't do that, in, especially not chasing photographs. No photograph is worth, you know, damaging the environment for. Well, that was really great, uh, Vandit. Thank you so, so much. Really okay. interesting. Makes me want to come and dive again immediately, which is, of course, not possible. But <laughs> as soon as you open up and as soon as I can, would love to be there, as I'm sure everybody else who's heard your talk will also be considering this very seriously. There's lots and lots of thank you for the great talk and amazing stuff and all that coming along. And really, thanks, Vandit. That was Thank really you guys nice. for watching. And again, if you have any questions, you can always drop them to Nick or you can message me on Facebook or whatever. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys may have about diving, equipment, whatever. I'm a gear junkie. I, like, I love talking gear. So I'm happy to discuss <laughs> that with you. And of course, anything related to diving. It doesn't, and it doesn't have to be diving with us. If you're interested in diving, I, I, got, I, I didn't get into sport to get rich, unfortunately. I got into sport because <laughs> I liked it. So. <laughs> Great, Mandit. Thank you. And Thanks, hope guys. to see the best of you again next week for our next talks. Uh, thank you, everyone. And bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.